I want to thank, as always, Telos for the great sound. And by the way, uh, we are uh, re-encoding the uh, the archives. Uh, you may have noticed, uh, because I'm going to call attention to last night's show. Boy, am I going to call attention to it. Um, that the uh, last night's show is just spe- spectacular in a great way above the others in the archives. And by the end of the weekend, all the archives will sound that way. They're being re-encoded. I think you'll like it. But Telos uh, makes a year that gets it, you know, sounding so good. Keith Rowland, 20-year webmaster. My producer, Heather Wade, if you have a suggestion, send it to producer at artbell.com. The Belgab uh, website, very vaguely lovable people. <laughs> Midnight in Desert, people love Art Bell. Stream guys, they get you know, the stream out to you, lv.net gets it to the stream guys. And Peter Eberhardt sells whatever we have to sell, which is only about six minutes of commercial time per hour, so your commercial gets heard really well. All right. Last night, and it hasn't happened a lot in my broadcast career, but last night I was had. I was really had last night, and I must tell you that, uh, like many of you, I went went back home last night shaking my head, going, what just happened? And it worked on me. I couldn't sleep. I thought about it. I refer now to uh, Blanche Barton, my guest last night, the High Priestess of the Church of Satan, the Chairmistress of the Council of Nine, Anton LaVey's uh, lover, partner, the mother of his child. All about Satan. And um, I'm sure that many of you who listened last night expected the sound of rattling chains, deep, dark, terrible things to be told, the fires of hell to be discussed, And there was none of that. Gee whiz, Blanche Barton was, what can I say? She was articulate, smooth as silk. Blanche Barton was intelligent, extremely well-spoken. And it didn't hit me until I did something I almost never do. I sat down and actually re-listened to last night's show. And here's what I'm going to tell you. It creeped me out more than any program I've ever done on the re-listen. It should have hit me last night. I I was had. I mean, she was so sweet. And I, I should have caught on in the first, I think, 20 minutes of the show. Uh, we were talking about casting spells, I believe. And she said, oh, yes, 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 I might cast a spell and uh, on some guy. And then he'll go to Hawaii and something wonderful will happen to him. It should have hit me. It should have hit me. You don't you don't sell Satan to people with chains and blood and fire and damnation and hell. That's not how you sell Satan. You sell Satan with trickery. That's what Satan's all about, trickery. And when I went back to listen to the show understanding that it completely creeped me out not only is she the real thing on paper in other words uh she she's head of the uh, the church of satan she is the real thing and that's how the real thing sounds and if you want a truly truly creepy experience trust me on this go back to last night's show after what I've just told you, if it didn't hit you last night, I, I know that it didn't hit many because they were expecting, well, you know, scary stuff, right? Scary stuff. But that's not what we got. What we got was smooth as silk. What we got was, well, I don't know, a promise of something wonderful on a Hawaiian vacation. What we got last night was the real thing. We got an invitation to join Satan. So, <laughs> if you are a time traveler, if you have access to the archives, um, well, here's the way I thought of her. In fact, do you remember during the show, if you heard the show, I asked her if she was an attorney. 
She said no. But boy, she sure did sound like an attorney. In fact, she sounded like, to me, the counsel to the devil. Last night I was had. Uh, Roman in Indio says Archie was articulate, alluring, enchanting, and seductive. <laughs> yeah, that that really about sums it up all right. And it just it, it hit me like a brick. You can't imagine how it hit me. Uh, maybe you can. <laughs> I don't think you can. I suddenly realized, um, well, where where was the scary stuff, you know? I was reading people's reviews, and they were saying, gee, that wasn't scary. But if you go back and you listen to it now, I absolutely guarantee you, you will understand what you're hearing, and what you're hearing is the real thing. That was the, that that was Satan's counsel. That's what that was. That's that's my own opinion. She was Satan's counsel, and she was very, very, very good at what she did. And if that doesn't shake you and rattle you and go down and tempt your soul. All right. So uh, we have another show for you tonight. It's going to be a good one. Andrew Bashago is here. Andrew is a lawyer from Washington State. He holds six academic qualifications, including degrees from UCLA and Cambridge. So no lightweight, that's for sure. He was participant in two secret U.S. defense projects. In the early 1970s, he was a child participant in a DARPA project called Pegasus. That was the first U.S time-space exploration program at the time of the emergence of time travel in the U.S. That's right, time travel in the U.S. defense technical community. In the early 80s, he was a young adult participant in the CIA's Mars Jump Room program, which used a revolutionary transport technology to put a human presence on the red planet. Today, Andy is waging a truth campaign to reveal his experiences in these programs to all of us so humanity can understand the true extent of technical development on our planet and the true history of our activities in outer space. On tonight's show, we, however, will focus on Andy's experiences in uh, the, the DARPA project, the project called Pegasus. Uh, Andrew, welcome to the program. Howdy, Art. It's good Hi. to be on with you after all these years. I, I think I've probably waited 15 years because I've got some critical information for you about time travel and, a, in fact, a, qu- a quantum bombshell uh, to drop tonight that I've been saving for you as a as a gift, really, for all the great reporting you've done over the years on, on time travel. A quantum bombshell. Uh, and right. you, you mentioned this to me before without telling me what it was, so I have no idea what it is. And you say you're going to drop drop this quantum bombshell probably at the beginning of the third hour. Yeah, I think that would be best, just so it doesn't overshadow the, the interview. But um, Oh, me too. I mean, you, you, listen, that's you got to make people wait. <laughs> that's what you do. Uh, anyway, uh, it is good to have you, and I, I'm glad that you have, uh, through the years, listened on and off. That's great. So, I don't know. Let us begin at the beginning. Uh, You've got quite an extensive uh, education, and you've got uh, pretty good qualifications. So I can imagine that you somehow were involved in these projects, but it actually began for you, I think, when you were very young. So if you can, describe what DARPA's Project Pegasus was and how you became involved. DARPA was a classified defense-related research and development project under the Department of Defense. Specifically, the coordinating agency was was DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Mm -hmm. But there was multi-agency development, and the primary defense contractor involved from the private sector was the Ralph M. Parsons Company, one of the world's leading engineering firms. And it, it sort of cast an umbrella. It was an umbrella agency, but it it, it cast a kind of a net into which they were putting anything and everything that would yield a time-space exploration capability. And by 1970, they had already 
uh, reduced to practice essentially eight different modalities of what could broadly be categorized as or classified as time travel from psychic time travel involving conventional remote viewing mm -hmm. all the way into different forms of um, of physical time travel. So I want to be perfectly clear that I'm not sharing a, a tall tale. I'm actually revealing something very significant, which is the true history of the development of time travel within the U.S. defense technical community. That's the historical context in which time travel actually emerged. And by the way, I, I, I just really want to say this and get this out so people understand. You were to be on the show um, two days ago, but um, I really want the audience to understand the truth. We tried to connect with you on, uh, on Skype, and of course, as you know, we had a big bad hum. And uh, secondary to that, uh, there was the possibility of a cell phone, which, of course, is not going to fly for a three-hour interview. And beyond that, I think you had a landline with a um, a portable phone that was the battery was dead, so <laughs> we didn't have any choice. People think that we did this on purpose. Some people, I think, think that uh, Andy, and so I just want you to verify for everybody that that is exactly what happened. Right. I think something about the momentousness of tonight's discussion maybe. between the two of us maybe was throwing some of that energy backward in time and sort of circumvented the technical infrastructure we needed to to do a great interview tonight. So I'm glad that we did postpone and, and reschedule for tonight. So what actually happened is you went out and bought a landline phone, plugged it into the wall, and that's how you and I are talking right now. Correct. Okay. All right. So um, they had all those modalities of for looking into time travel. Now, what, what DARPA does is, in fact, look into these kind of weird, edgy things. That's what DARPA is all about, right? Right. DARPA's legislative mandate from the United States Congress is to uh, prevent military surprise. So ultimately, or initially, I should say, the time travel project began after the famous October, or excuse me, July 1952 overflight of our nation's capital by nine extraterrestrial craft that were clocked at Langley Air Force Base at traveling at 7,000 miles per hour, which exceeded our flight capabilities, our, our jet aircraft capabilities of that time. Sure. But those, but those extraterrestrial crafts. Now, this sighting was reported on the front page of the Washington Post. Oh, in actually, the people, Times. people can go back and you can get a front page picture of the Post, and you can see these uh, UFOs or whatever they are, uh, just as you described, going right over the Capitol. That's a fact. Right, and what they were also seen doing was disappearing in one location in the sky and mm -hmm. then reappearing elsewhere, and we concluded that our extraterrestrial visitors were in possession of time travel, basically of teleportation. So my, my late father, Raymond F. Bashago, had been working at Okanite Company in Paramus, New Jersey. And in October of 1952, a U.S. Air Force colonel showed up at his desk at, at Okanite and ordered him to report the next Monday to the Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Wood Ridge, New Jersey, <laughs> where my dad designed the metal alloy by which the ramjet plane would not melt from friction in our atmosphere uh, in, as a result of contact with molecules of air and would also not melt when it went outside of our atmosphere from friction with space dust because the goal of the ramjet project was to essentially chase these extraterrestrial craft away from Earth. And that was my father's entry essentially into the classified defense-related research realm, the, the black project realm. And, at this, and point, went, yeah, at this point, how old were you? Well, in the 50s, I had not yet been born. I was born on September 18th of 1961 as the youngest of five children. So my father married in 1955 after three years at, um, at Curtis Wright. And then he entered a very creative period of his career that's essential to understanding how Project Pegasus fell together. Okay. He was working from 1956 to 64 after leaving um, Curtis Wright. He was working at the Thomas A. Edison Research Laboratory in West Orange, New Jersey. Now, this was not the historical Edison labs. It was a kind of a think tank that was uh, pioneered by Neil T. Williams, my father's um, essentially his supervisor and his co-inventor of several electronic 
patents of that era. And it was a very prestigious think tank. For example, two desks over from my dad was J.B. Johnson, who essentially made the timeline of key discoveries in 20th century physics by uh, discovering uh, signal-to-ground noise, basically Johnson noise, what we might call white noise, in 1928. Foster C. Nix, the prominent uh, solid-state physicist, was also in this small lab in West Orange. And much of what my dad did were higher-end math problems that were uh, a result of the development of different electronic components that were then being developed by that particular think tank, uh, primarily staffed with electrical engineers. But then he was, at some point, he was asked um, by the United States government to repeat Nikola Tesla's teleportation experiments that Tesla had been uh, tinkering with since his famous stay in Colorado Springs, Colorado in 1899. That was, in fact, the beginning of what would become Project Pegasus. All right. Well, you're telling me something I didn't know. I, I had no idea Tesla had been tinkering with teleportation. In fact, there were three individuals on what would become Project Pegasus when I began serving in the late 60s and early 70s who affirmed the debt of gratitude that Project Pegasus owed Tesla. They were my late father, who certainly knew as essentially the point man between Parsons and the CIA on the theory and practice of Tesla teleportation because he had mastered all that uh, at the Edison labs between 56 and 64. That was also confirmed by Jack Pruitt, who served as um, a team leader on Project Pegasus, and according to Nichols and Moon, I think it's quite probable or quite believable, served as the research director for Project Montauk later in the early 80s. And the debt owed Tesla was also affirmed by a very distinguished member of Pegasus, and that was uh, Dr. Robert Beckwith, who would go on to earn, I think, perhaps 20 uh, patents, U.S. patents, on some of the most advanced electronic components that would be bought up by Robert Noyce and would become what we now call Intel Corporation. All right, so Andy, you're so describing this, aren't you, as uh, the real Philadelphia experiment? Right. I, I want to make it completely clear, and also I want my critics to know that I'm sharing this information because I felt that I was under a moral duty to do so. When I look back around 2000, at that point, being a fan of the Art Bell Show for, I think, 12 years, I think since the late 80s, I would listen to the different time travel guests and think about what I had been part of. And I thought, my God, my status would be sort of like having been an office boy for the Wright brothers when they <laughs> developed flight. I mean, I have the inside account. This was the project in which time travel was actually developed. Now, there was a Philadelphia experiment, but the one that we know is a cover story that was scripted by the Office of Naval Intelligence to delink the three critical connections, between the three elements, uh, namely Tesla, teleportation, and the Los Alamos physicists. What would become Project Pegasus and the real Philadelphia experiment was the secret twin of Project Manhattan, the atomic bomb project. And some of the same individuals who worked on the bomb were quietly um, working with time travel for 25 years so that by the time I entered Pegasus as a child participant in the winter of 1968, Tesla teleportation of human beings through vortal tunnels in time space had been successfully reduced to practice. Um, question for you. I, of course, um, spoke, had a number of interviews with regard to the Philadelphia experiment, and uh, some of the technical details were revealed. And I'm recalling um, rotating magnetic fields and all the rest of it. And it does, frankly, Andy, sound an awful lot like the same kind of technology that one might imagine could be applied to travel in time. Yes, but the, the, the story that has been propagated is a cover story. And there were critical differences in terms of what really happened. And our, our informant on this was somebody who was telling this story when I was a child on Project Pegasus in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Mm -hmm. And in four interviews, two conduct, uh, conducted by myself, one conducted by the writer Alexandra Bruce, and one conducted by Ken Thomas, the great uh, crusading journalist at Steam Shovel Press, 
over 25 years at that point, really ultimately to um, the, the early 2010s, to the time that Beckwith was now about 80, shortly before his death, he affirmed the same information, which is that the actual Philadelphia experiment did not take place in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. It took place in Long Island Sound. <laughs> it did not involve the Eldridge, and it involved a ship called the Martha's Vineyard. Okay. It was not an experiment into radar invisibility of the Eldridge. It was an experiment into Tesla teleportation of the Martha's Vineyard after the Nazi Navy began chaining ordnance to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and presenting a military threat to our ships at sea. It did not result in multiple sailors being fused in the deck of the Eldridge. It involved the death of one sailor who, when the ship went back not to Norfolk, Virginia, but to Newport News, Virginia, was falling through time space and was impaled on a column that supported the splash cowling of the Martha's Vineyard. And here's the critical connection. Inside the captain's mast of that ship, the Martha's Vineyard, was not Albert Einstein, as some have speculated, and was not John von Neumann, as was part of the cover story that was propagated, but were the Manhattan Project physicists J. Robert Oppenheimer and Dr. Edward Teller, and I can say that I met the latter during my childhood experiences in Project Pegasus. So we've gotten the gist of the fact that there was an important time travel uh, experiment or an experiment that accidentally yielded a a teleportation capability, but it is a false story. It is naval disinformation. The actual Philadelphia experiment is such as I I just described. Wow. And all of this information came to you from your father? No, that particular uh, information was the, (laughs) it was the content of frequent soliloquies delivered by Dr. Robert Beckwith Uh at lunch in Albuquerque when we were sharing a meal with our colleagues on Project Pegasus. Uh, Individuals like the science director of the project, Dr. Harold Agnew, when he was the director of the Los Alamos National Labs. Mm-hmm. Teller was sometimes at lunch. I remember several lunches that Dr. Ivan Browning attended when he was the director of science and technology for CIA. Beckwith was obsessed regarding the, the real Philadelphia experiment, and he was constantly correcting uh, those present so that they had the critical facts of what had happened, and hence the critical debt of gratitude that Pegasus owed Tesla. For Dark Matter News, I'm Leo Ashcraft. UFO watchers are in a tiz over the discovery of an ancient skeleton with an elongated skull that resembles an alien. The humanoid skeleton was unearthed from a site known as Russia's Stonehenge, and it's being heralded as proof that aliens visited Earth thousands of years ago. However, archaeologists don't share the same view as alien hunters, insisting that the skeleton belonged to a female from a tribe that used to bind the head to make it grow out of shape. Read the full article at artbell.com. NASA's one-ton Curiosity rover landed on Mars three years ago. As the car-sized rover touched down on the Martian surface, it ushered in a new era of planetary exploration on Mars. But it was also the start of something else. Curiosity's sardonic Twitter alter ego, known as the Sarcastic Rover. The Sarcastic Rover parody Twitter account came into being on August 6, 2012, the night of the famous seven minutes of terror landing that brought Curiosity to the Martian surface. Sarcastic Rover's brand of science-minded wit was apparent from the moment it arrived on Twitter. Sarcastic Rover acts like any of us would after being sent to Mars. It's kind of upset, a little lonely, and it wants to make fun of everything. The parody account resonated with people immediately. The account attracted some 7,000 followers during its first night online, according to Jason Philatralt, a screenwriter and the mind behind the Sarcastic Robot. Sarcastic Rover now has about 134,000 followers three years into Curiosity's mission. A researcher thinks a possible secret doorway hiding within the walls of King Tut's tomb could hold the biggest archaeological discovery ever made. A detailed look at high-resolution scans of King Tutankhamun's tomb might have revealed hidden rooms, according to a noted Egyptologist. And if true, he said it could be the biggest archaeological discovery ever made. Nicholas Reeves, a residential scholar at the University of Arizona School of Anthropology and former curator of the British Museum's Department of Egyptian Antiquities, scrutinized scans taken by art replication specialists Factum Art in 2014. 
He wrote in a study published last month that these scans provide immediate desk-based access to the smallest iconographic detail and brushstroke of the KV-62 scenes, KV-62 being King Tut's tomb. Reeves' study published online by the Armana Royal Tombs Project, a project he founded in 1998, reveals that after cautious evaluation of the scans, he believes that there are two previously unknown, untouched doorways. Reeves said that the implications are extraordinary. If digital appearance translates into physical reality, it seems we are now faced not merely with the prospect of a new Tutankhamun-era storeroom to the west, to the north appears to be a continuation of tomb KV-62, and within these uncharted depths, an earlier royal interment, that of Nerferti herself, celebrated consort, co-regent, and eventual successor of Pharaoh Akinate. <laughs> Witnesses say three people were performing an exorcism in a Texas public park. It started getting louder and louder and louder. I think she was on the ground and they were standing over her with hands on her, screaming, Satan, I demand that you depart. You've been, you know, and it just went on and on and on. <laughs> That's the reaction from one bystander after what eyewitnesses are calling an exorcism. It has also concerned the local clergyman, Father Dave Hawksley. My overriding thought in that is I hope that the people who are doing it in some level of training. He describes exorcism as the removal of an evil spirit through the use of prayer and originates from the gospel of Jesus. The person who they're exercising, that person's getting the care that they need. Police say they were called to the scene, but since it's not illegal to perform an exorcism in a public place, they did not take action. No injuries were reported. He says, what we know, or think we know, about the Philadelphia experiment is not accurate. I listened, of course, years ago to uh, Al Bielik describe technical details of the Philadelphia experiment, uh, which you now say was kind of cover for what was really going on. Is that fair? Yes, it's a cover story. Uh, It involved another ship, another technical process. But the critical thing they were concealing was the linkage between Tesla teleportation and the very Los Alamos physicists that developed the atomic bomb and continued to to design more destructive nuclear weapons, um, you know, in the in the latter half of the 20th century. Oh, yes. OK. Um, you, you describe eight modalities. Um, Correct. Is there a way to go through them fairly quickly so we can get a, a rough understanding Yes, especially if we conceive of it as a spectrum with, let's say, psychic time travel on the left, and then what I call physio-virtual kinds of time travel in the middle, and then into the physical forms of, of, of time travel. On the left side of the spectrum, the sort of the fuzzy logic side of the spectrum, right. we, have, we have psychic time travel in the form of conventional remote viewing. Okay. I can correct the historical record on that. Ingo Swan often claimed that remote viewing began at SRI in 1972. Right. However, I and my childhood colleagues, I like to say that we were small mediums at large, we were doing (laughs) conventional remote viewing for the Office of Naval Intelligence no later than the fall of 1969. And in fact, we were tasked, and it makes sense why we were, because John McCain's father was then the commander of the entire Pacific Fleet, of the United States Navy. We were asked to determine whether uh, Lieutenant Commander McCain was in the POW compound known as the Hanoi Hilton, and if so, where he was in the building. I imagine they either wanted to to bomb his location or maybe extricate him from that location. Okay, the very typical target for remote viewing. Right. We were doing conventional remote viewing for the United States Navy. Then they began manipulating our environment, or at least our perception, One of the things they were doing was spinning us, and by spinning us, inducing out-of-body experiences. During one of those OBEs, I came to a mechanical limit beyond which uh, my consciousness could not not go any any farther. When I described that machine or that limit to the astral plane, this was a direct quote from the lady from DARPA who was debriefing me. She said, others have described it. We think it's the technical infrastructure that's propagating the hologram that we find ourselves in. We're calling it the matrix. And this was upon me returning to my body from an an induced OBE, induced by being physically spun clockwise on my back, 
beneath a spiral image on the ceiling at 33 rotations per minute, which is certainly a curious number in many ways. The Masonic connection, the connection to the recording industry with the 33 RPM uh, records. Um, but we, we not only were going out of body, but when I reached the physical limit of those OBEs one time, that's what the, the debriefing uh, lady from DARPA said. And this was, what, 29 years before the production and release of the Matrix trilogy, right. by the way? Right. I, I can clearly see how the spinning you talked about, the physical spinning, could lead to an alternative uh, altered state, I guess. Yes, and that was what I call astral time travel. They deracinated our minds almost in a shamanic way, a very tribal way, and we left our bodies and went elsewhere, and then we were questioned about where we went. Got it. So that, again, is very fuzzy logic, time travel. All right. We have a long way to go to get to eight modalities here. <laughs> okay. okay. Now, uh, then um, in fall of 70, well, in, in – um, they actually started some of the physical time travel first, but let me, let me stick in, you know, within the logic of the spectrum that I'm sure, describing. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Then in fall of 70 – um, they took us to the general manufacturing company, the map making facility of Standard Oil, which was then in, I think it still was until very recently, in Convent Station, New Jersey. Okay. And there they had a device called a chronovisor. A chronovisor is an electro optical device that propagates a hologram that is so dense that it has the effect of lensing a non local event into the laboratory, an event from what we would call the past or the future. If you stand away from the hologram, you can see something going on inside this cubicle field of light hmm. generated from a crystal array in the ceiling uh, that has either happened in the past on some timeline or has happened in the future on some timeline. So being able to watch the future or the past, uh, was it actually controllable? Could you um, design what you would see or was it random? Well, the chronovisors were still experimental when I was brought into the project in officially in fall of 1969, the beginning of my third grade year. Wow. And they were trying to just focus the holograms. They were, it was sort of like trying to focus um, an old-fashioned television image. They were going on the, on the blink a lot. They were kind of wobbling and then <laughs> blinking out. Got you. Now, yeah. Now, now the the paradox or the the time the way in which the chronovisors became time machines uh, was basically as follows: when you stood inside that hologram, in other words, when you stood on the stage of the device, and the crystal array was turned on above you with such brilliance that we were actually conditioned in a Pavlovian way not to look up at the light because they knew we would be rendered completely blind for life. We would be blinded. It was so so blindingly brilliant of a light. But so we were trained not to look up. I now have 2,700 vision, so maybe my visual cortex was damaged by the chronovisors. But the, the way in which it became a time machine was that when we were standing in the hologram, we instantaneously went to that event scenario on either wow. this timeline or another one that was being tuned in by the chronovisor. The, but when they were training us for the chronovisor, they were question, somewhat I'm, I'm sorry, question. Was it yeah. stable? Was it stable? By that I mean uh, you can imagine something like this. If it moved, shifted, or did anything wrong, you'd be in trouble. Right. When they turned it off, it would go randomly through different time-space images, like a psychedelic uh, short feature. Got it. But when they, when they were operating it, they could operate it on a standing basis and send us to specific periods of time. For example... I spent much of the first half of the summer of 1971 in New Mexico being sent to the mud in the street in front of Ford's Theater to, talk, to walk into Ford's Theater on April 14th of 1865 to, um, to, see, to get behind the balcony seating that the Lincolns were sitting in and see who shot President Abraham Lincoln. Oh. And they must have sent me, I don't know, six, seven times. In fact, on one of those jumps in the chronovisor, I looked to my right and I saw myself walking through the theater. And only later on the sixth or seventh jump, I looked to my left and completed that meeting with myself. 
so there you go in terms of the, the paradox of sending the same person to the same event in time space. I, there was actually a duplication of my own presence at that event. That must I have been really able. weird to, to meet yourself. My God. Oh, yeah. I remember I remember seeing myself on the right, and I thought I was walking along um, a long mirror looking at my image. But then the image of myself over on my right deviated over to the right, and I thought, my God, that's not my image in a mirror. That is me, right. probably on a later jump. And then on a later jump, I realized, hey, there I am over on the left looking at myself. Okay, uh, a couple of questions, if I might, please. Was yeah. your, your father at this point still involved in the project? Oh, my dad was one of the project principals on Project Pegasus. Okay, and, and you were, area, excuse uh, me, you were how old, please? I first teleported via Tesla teleportation between the Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey, and the Santa Fe, um, the, the New Mexico State Capitol grounds in Santa Fe, New Mexico, right. in the winter of 1968 at age six and a half. Six and a half. And that was, that, and my, brother, my, my father brought me right into a meeting with Dr. Harold Agnew when my dad was presenting the prospectus to test Tesla teleportation on both adults and children. All right. Well, here, here is my question. Um, it's hard for me to imagine a dad, being a dad, allowing um, his own son to participate in something that, um, you know, was potentially very, very dangerous. Now, maybe from his point of view, it was not dangerous, but sending your own son into something like this is incredible. Um, as you think back on it now... How do you think your dad justified this to himself? Well, the defense technical community he was working for was looking at two threats. I call them the grays and the reds. Basically, they were concerned about what our extraterrestrial visitors might be presenting. They weren't presuming there was a security threat, but they were mindful that um, Could have been. different species from outer space with superior technology and development might present a threat of colonization or domination of, of the course, world, yes, of course, enslavement of the world, annihilation of the world. They were also concerned. I mean, it's it's funny to think back, but their chief concern regarding the former Soviet Union and their chief conventional military threat that they were worried about was actually a landing of the Soviet army on the continental United States by the Soviet Navy. So that was the background in the field he was working in. But personally, my dad commented one time when. Raymond Kubik, his supervisor at Parsons, flew to New Mexico rather than teleported, teleported there to meet us during the summer of 1971. And he said, you know, Ray doesn't think that any of us should be teleporting. He thinks that the dangers haven't been worked out. Sure. But I think it's clear that the dangers have been worked out. And, you know, involving you, uh, Andrew, you know, every time human beings have gone to a better world, like let's say left their island after they exhausted the local fishery or went to another area of the forest to find happier hunting grounds, even if they had to ford an ocean or a river, let's say, they, I mean, it's very human for, for humans to have put their children on their shoulders and gone with them into that future realm, that future environment. True. And, 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 and that's what I'm doing with you. You know, you're uh, actually Uncle uh, Ray Kubik had sort of an uncle role in our family as we were growing up because he was my dad's supervisor at multiple defense contractors and a family friend. He said, you know, your Uncle Ray thinks I shouldn't be involving you. And I told him, look, this is the human future. Why, why shouldn't we involve our children once we found from our Navy enlisted personnel that these devices are safe? And, you know, I really feel privileged even cosmically privileged, that my dad made that moral choice. I should also add that my dad had served as a combat medic and ambulance driver with the 13th Airborne Division in France and Germany during World War II. Mm -hmm. And he had seen a lot, of, a lot of death, and he had seen a lot of you know, dead children as well. And he may have been somewhat coarsened to the risk that I was undertaking, because to be sure, I was being exposed to new dangerous and experimental technologies. Mm -hmm. But I think his response would be, look, if we're going to maintain our autonomy as a human race on Earth against the extraterrestrials who, who are coming here, uh, who we don't know what security threat they pose, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the so Soviet Union, 
We have to take our entire civilization into this better world, this world in which we can be, um, you know, teleporting between London and Sydney in three seconds, not in 24 hours. So he was adamant about the fact that he had gone through the moral choice making and in his mind reached the right moral conclusion that especially because of the reasons why children were involved. And I'd like to share those with you. OK, I, I mean, I stories. understand at six and a half. I understand Oh, Dad, I want to do this, uh, whether it's for yeah. mankind or because it's fun or it's whatever. A six-and-a-half-year-old, of course you wanted to do it. Dad, harder choice, deeper thought. Well, yeah, but there, was, there were national security uh, considerations, so let me, let me share those. Sure. The reason children were used in Pegasus, the first reason is we were experimentees. They had this Tesla teleportation technology, and they expected to be teleporting, for example, the president of the United States, the vice president, the secretary of state and other executive, military, and intelligence officials, and their families. So we were experimentees into the mental and physical effects of Tesla teleportation on bright, healthy children from stable, intact family backgrounds, such as the first children would be. Right. I think of the Obama daughters, you know, um, Sasha and Malia. Mm -hmm. When they first came into public limelight, they were about the age that I was when I was first teleporting to make teleportation safe for the, 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 the country's first children because they would be going with you know, their dad, the president, uh, if we implemented this in the executive um, branch. Okay. The second reason is we were necessities. And this goes back to the, um, to the chronovisors. The chronovisors saw so much experimentation in Pegasus because unlike Tesla teleportation, they could go back in the past on an unlimited basis. I was sent, for example, on my second uh, chronovisor jump to 100 million B.C. to see some dinosaurs in, in you know, prehistoric Arizona. If that had been done with Tesla teleportation, I would have been stranded there. I would have been lost in time. Not in space, but in time. So they were working extensively with, with chronovision because of this unbounded time envelope. If you sent, you know, again, if it, they could only use the Tesla teleportation for jumps uh, backward in time of a day, a week, a year, but not before the advent of Tesla teleportation. That was not so with the chronovision because when they collapsed the holograms, we were back on the stage in New Jersey excuse me, in New Jersey or New Mexico or wherever right. Right. the device had originally been located that propagated the hologram that sent us back in time. Now, because the holograms were going on the blink all the time and the technicians were having conniption fits, basically trying to make them stable, they found that they needed to use either very bright adult diminutive people, small people, mm -hmm. you know, little people, or, or they could use bright you know, they could use children from gifted and talented student programs around the country. And they thought, well, since they're also going to be trainees to be the first generation of adult American chrononauts trained in childhood, let's work with bright and gifted children, gifted and talented children, okay. rather than with diminutive adults. So we were also trainees. I was present in a kind of a sidebar discussion between the defense attache to Project Pegasus, Donald Rumsfeld and my father at a bar in Albuquerque sometime in the early 70s. And Secretary Rumsfeld said the following to my father. He said, Ray, we expect to send the children to the Naval Academy and use that as a pretext for involving them in future project activities. And in fact, I was set up to go to the Naval Academy. And really, my refusal to meet with my local congressman, who was Barry Goldwater Jr., really began my rebellion and what would become my truth campaign regarding the time travel activities that uh, I was secretly involved with by the United States government. I decided to not accept uh, the bid to go to Annapolis, even though the, the skids had been greased for me to go there, because I was one of the kids who had served a in a time travel capacity earlier in my life in Pegasus. Right. So we were also trainees. We were time-space cadets that they were grooming to use in adulthood. I've got it. But uh, as he sent you back, particularly um, multiple times to the same location, um, had they already determined that there were not going to be paradox problems, or was that a possible danger for you when you went back and, <clears throat> and met yourself or whatever? No. Uh, after deciding that children had to be used and my dad having the faith in me 
as a tough, blocky-headed, very bright young man, we were still dealing with the threat, in fact, of, of catastrophe. Let me just get, cite one example. When we were trained by Jack Pruitt in summer of 70 to begin Tesla teleporting, we had, we, we had some uh, contingency training that if, for example, we jumped through the device at Curtis Wright in 1971, and we found to our dismay that it was 1791 in mm. Santa Fe when we got there, right. we should approach the most responsible person we could find, the parish priest, the sheriff, the town mayor, and ask to be adopted into his household because we were going to be stuck there in time. Oh, my. So hold it, hold it right there. We're, we're at a break point. Stand by.